Why is pleasure, play, and power important to public health? I'm here with Veronica Orkia. Orkia? Did I say that? Orkia? Does, I got yep. it right? <laughs> and Andrea Augustine. Um, and they, um, Veronica is from sexisdc.org. Um, and you're talking at the Woodhull Sexual Freedom Summit this in a couple months on pl pleasure, pa play, and power and public health. There's a lot of P's. I'm stuttering today. I apologize. <laughs> um, and I'm really curious, like, what what does that mean? Like, why are those important for public health? Well, why are you giving this talk? Well, I think um, for us, we, we work for DC Health, for the Department of Public Health and um, the district. And, you know, the typical public health prevention messaging um, focused around the don't do's, the risk. Um, and, in, and in sexual health, that's really, <laughs> it's, it's not the best way to go. Um, at least, at least for our perspective, we really wanted to talk about. Obviously, there are risks. Obviously, we do have concerns, um, but we wanted to be really real about what sex is. Um, oh, look at that sex! <laughs> I love um, that. Well, <laughs> the pleasure piece and um, the why people have sex and how people um, how people have sex and the different ways and to be judgment free and in talking to both young people and older people realized that we really needed to shift our messaging um, and incorporate that. And that was a natural place for us and our team that we work with um, at, at DC Health. But uh, we, we came from that originally, but really starting to infuse it into the work. And um, and we, we thankfully didn't get much pushback when we said, this is really where, where we wanna go. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think also too, you know, like it, despite people's knowledge of the risks, people are still having sex. I mean, that knowing about HIV or pregnancy or STIs, pregnancy too, because it is a sexually transmitted condition. <laughs> it definitely is. You know, typically, uh, typically. Not always. Yeah, you know. <laughs> but that those things don't really deter people from having sex per se. There's so much more involved in decision in when one makes a decision whether or not to have sex. And so, you know, um, we really wanted to address some of the broader factors that drive sexual decision making. And then the other piece too is when we, in, in our work with youth in particular, we kind of felt like the negative uh, or sex negative and risk reduction focused messaging was kind of unfair because it also just didn't acknowledge that youth sexual, it's part of youth sec, uh, healthy sexual development, experimentation and exploring. And, and they might and, enjoy it. And they might and enjoy that's okay. It, and that's okay. <laughs> and it, it really kind of invalidated those experiences. Um, and so, and, and we're driving youth away from us. And so we really wanted to be thoughtful about what youth sexual, I can't, I keep stumbling over that sex, youth sexual health development. <laughs> and, you know, really be supportive of it. Uh, you know, um, the, the, that if when thinking about youth transition to adulthood, you know, we would like them to become adults who have positive sexual health outcomes and that starts from an early age. And they enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they do, they're gonna do it. We really would have, um, and other uh, people who are, who are educating young people, um, would have young women talking about the fact that they were having sex and it was painful and that it hurt, mm -hmm. but they were still doing it. Um, so that kind of enjoy it part is is half joking, but half real that that we want to make sure that young people know, like if you're having sex and it it's hurting um, and you're not enjoying it or you're getting nothing out of it, then that's that's not what you should be doing, right? right? Like we need to we need to to make sure that young people understand all the parts of sex, right? Not that just if something um, is is dripping or has a bump on it, that right. it's, that you worry about it. No, I think it's pain right it's so important my a good friend of mine her son just is in seventh grade and he just had the talk at school and all he came back with was stis and scared i'm never gonna have sex and i'm like yeah. okay so this kid is never gonna he doesn't want to talk to his mom about it literally traumatized like yeah. mm -hmm. doesn't want to talk to his mom his dad his friends about it and now he's shut down around it and i think that means we can get so much more we can say hey this is pleasurable this here's a carrot like, and let's figure out how to do it right. Not yeah. we're going to beat you away from it. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And the reality of it is that, you know, the youth sexual health demographic in D.C. is such that, you know, youth 15 to 24 have some of the highest rates of gonorrhea and chlamydia. So, you know, the risk reduction messaging is just not working yeah. because 
are still being impacted. So we really need to think about how can we really reach youth in a meaningful way. We're not trying to stop youth from having sex in order to prevent them from having STIs. We're trying to just help them do it more safely and let them understand how to take care of themselves, how to get tested, how to get treated, and that those things are okay to do. And you should be able to ask for help. You should be able to ask for information. And, you know, trying to really create what we, how do we call it? We say... Uh, Galvanizing a new consciousness. consciousness <laughs> I love that. I she wrote that. <laughs> but I but I also think there it, it is this piece of um when people say, you know, why 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 sex is and you know, um one of the things that we, we also do, we also work on adult programming mm-hmm. and um our our power of the P and our prep for women um campaigns are are really about adults owning their sexuality and understanding what they like, also for prevention. And one of the things that I, I say, and this is for young and old, is that you know, if you know what makes you have an orgasm, if you know what turns you on, if you know how you like to be touched and then you can negotiate that in a relationship, it's really easier to say, I think we need to go get tested or to go to your doctor and say, you know what, this, this isn't right and I need to get this checked out. Mm-hmm. But when we're so afraid to talk about any part of it, it's really hard to take care of your health because you know, you talk about down there. Yeah, um, yeah. I did yeah. for years, it's all, I, I kept using <laughs> down there and someone's finally like, no, you're an adult, please use the full, <laughs> use your words. And, you know, from a, on the personal side of things, Veronica and I and some of the other members on our team, we're moms. We have children, and so, you know, we also have to, you know, walk the walk. We can't just talk the talk. So we are thinking about how we educate our children to be able to use the appropriate anatomy, words for the, the correct names for their anatomy and what have you, because the idea is we want them to, you know, be okay with themselves and be able to discuss things openly and freely when it comes to sex, you know? There's no wee-wee and no pee-pee, it's penis, it's vagina <laughs> from how or, you know, however old you are. And then as they continue to explore their bodies and learn their bodies, support them and validate them in that so that they know that A, their moms and families are safe places and people to come and talk to and that, you know, we're not going to be the ones who are like, don't have sex, don't get an STI, but we want to keep you safe. Here's how you do it. And hopefully this is an experience that we can replicate all over. You know, maybe they can talk to their peers about sex and they can talk to other people about sex, but it starts at home. And, you know, the idea is just thinking about positive sexual health outcomes over the life course, not just, you know, at a certain period in your life, but it start, we're sexual beings from the moment we're born. Yeah, so. we are. We're discovering ourselves our whole lives and I just think I know how like when we get scared our primitive brain our survival brain gets really active and then the mm-hmm. first experience they have talking about is at school like you're gonna die everything's gonna fall off if you ever do this like oh my god like you can't be relaxed and sex is about being present and aware of your body not being terrified and awkward yeah, well, yeah. being terrified and awkward is sometimes part of it but um, <laughs> it shouldn't be the predominant part of it Right. Yeah, I really appreciate you both doing this work. It's amazing. Um, when, when you have, do you have people say no? You shouldn't be teaching kids this. Like, do you have objections to this? A little bit. So one one of the great things in in DC is that we have a pretty progressive um, community. I mean, we we've been doing STD screening in our in our schools for years. We we have a condom, a robust condom program that mm-hmm. Andrea oversees and. Um, condom, there's condoms everywhere. There's schools. condoms in the schools. There's there's young people that are certified to give out condoms to other young people in oh school. Oh my God, that's amazing. So they don't even have to go to an adult to ask for them. Well, so it used to be they had to go to the, the, the nurse who would give them the don't do it lecture and then give them 10 condoms and they'd have to have a watch a slide, <laughs> a, a slideshow. Um, and so we, the first, this was about nine years ago. So we changed it to any adult who took a test could become a, a condom passer. We call them rap MCs. And then um, young people advocated to say, can we just give out condoms? So they're kind of like condom dealers yeah, and they I have their clients they see every week yeah. and they, and, and it, it makes it, so we're, we're pretty progressive. There's always people who don't want, you know, anyone to talk to their kids about sex or any kids about sex. And that's everybody from people on the street to principals in the schools that mm-hmm. we have to go in and, you know, re up these conversations every year about why this is important. Um, we, with our sex is campaign, we have shirts and they say mm-hmm. sex is healthy, sex is real, sex is trust, sex is pride. Mm-hmm. Uh, our team definitely gets some pushback sometimes when they walk into schools with the sex is shirts on. How dare you use that word in front of these kids? They're gonna be harmed somehow. But I would say those are actually of the minority. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. those are the minority. We actually have um, far more people being like, I need that shirt, I need that shirt. Um, because they realize what it means for their adult lives yeah. too. You know what yeah. I mean? Like. Yeah. 
they're like, oh yeah, I actually agree with that. Yeah, that it's real. I believe that sex is trust. I believe it's communication, and yeah. you know, it's a message that again is Resonates. something that, uh, with the life yeah. course. Yeah, the yeah. life. The other thing, and shameless plug for the condom distribution yes. program, is that <laughs> no, we provide magnums for youth. So youth serving institutions are able to pr- get a uh, hold of magnums because we did the research. The research actually predated me, but the research basically showed that youth have an affinity for a magnum brand. And so we figured that if this is what the youth are gonna use. You give them what they're gonna use. <laughs> Walking around with these magnum penises, what we <laughs> imagined, we're gonna give them out so that people can have what you know, whatever they need or feel that they need to be sexually healthy. But what's funny is that we actually got pushed back on that from adults because they were worried that the um, the condoms were gonna slide off of mm-hmm. the young people who didn't actually have magnum sized mm-hmm. penises. And so we had to go, and I this I was this I was actually at a different agency, but um, our boss had to go and and do the measurements and and then put that in the paper so people so. We kind of, I, we're really lucky that we are in a place that like these things pop up and mm-hmm. we're allowed to like debunk the myths in mm-hmm. any way we need to and talk about it. And mm-hmm. we have amazing peer educators in the city and they go and they testify and they bring us data and they they advocate. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of those young people, when we were doing the focus groups around the youth campaign, around the sex is campaign, you know, she said the words that I think resonated so much with me when we were building this campaign. And she said, you have to retrain the adults. Mm-hmm. And that was everything. And we knew that, you know, we do an institute for for adults. You know, we talk to doctors and nurses and all the people who are supposed to know. They know about, often. About, about six, set, what about six, six. about six. <laughs> <laughs> and, but she said that, and that's been kind of like the carrying this through is always about like retrain the adults. So getting adults who, including those who work in our field, you know, sex educators who go out and do, do education in schools. And they still are doing the like, let me show you all the slides of, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and shankers. Yeah. Let me tell you how it's gonna fall off. And, and you'll never be able to have children because you'll be infertile. And- right, I mean, like, everyone loves to show the PID picture. Mm-hmm. Um, Blue waffle. So- <laughs> Blue waffle. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so getting these people who really mean well, these adults who really mean well and see themselves as trusted adults, to realize a trusted adult doesn't just use scare tactics. Mm-hmm. It shouldn't use scare tactics, that a trusted adult really listens and say, okay, so what are your questions? And here's how I answer that, and you know, um, and that think was, about what they would have liked when they were teenagers. Yeah, yeah. What right. kind of information and resources would have right. been helpful for them? Yeah. Adults love to say, well, you know, in my day, we were. Yeah, we, were just, right, yeah, we, were, yeah. we were so chaste and so pure. No, you weren't. No. So, <laughs> we, and even if you are, yeah. there you can still be sex positive even if you're not having sex. We're right. not encouraging people to have sex. We're not, I mean, we would love for everybody to have the best possible sex. When you're ready, ever. have the best sex Whenever ever. they're ready. But... <laughs> Even if you choose to be celibate, you're not having sex, what have you. You could have sex by yourself. You can have sex by Wonderful yourself. Wonderful sex by yourself. Or you could just at least, you know, uh, be confident in what you yeah. want when you do uh, sure. decide to embark on, you know, on, on having sex and know where to get tested and treated and know where the services are and be able to talk about yourself comfortably. And the idea is we don't want youth in particular to have to learn about their bodies and their pleasure from someone else, you know, it's, from their partner. wrong. I was in my 40s and 50s trying to figure out things that I should have, I wish I'd known. I'm a smart person. And I was like, <laughs> really? The clit has yeah. legs? Yeah. What are you talking about? Yeah. And that's the whole new consciousness piece where we're trying to make it so that, you know, these youth as they're transitioning into adulthood, they are comfortable and confident and knowledgeable, you know, as, as much as they can possibly and, be the young people but then also the adults that yes. were creating spaces for adults to learn um, in particular adult women mm-hmm. i would say that it, it, it's definitely skewed towards yeah. women yeah um are also because you know for 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 all the babies we have and sex we have and you know there's still this not knowing what we enjoy or what our bodies do or you know how the, pregnancy happens how pregnancy happens or that we have three holes the amount of times i know every sex educator has this like the times like the woman in the class is going wait we have three holes Mind blown. <laughs> um, but yeah, like just that, like wh- what do you like? What do you enjoy? Did you know that this is this is a possibility or these are options or, you know, what do these words mean? And, and creating spaces that aren't um, a classroom, you know, because you get to a certain age and like when do you even get to talk about sex in that way, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so how do you do it at a happy, you know, we have happy hours or mm-hmm. um, pop-up shops that we mm-hmm. um, uh, collaborate with or 
Um, we definitely we have a couple different people who want to do the paint and sips, you know, yeah. like and, and paint and sips and sex and mm -hmm. you know creating, which is not something a Department of Health typically does, right? Like no, but that awareness of our body, like we know more about from drivers that we know the parts of the car, we know what to ask for, what what warning signs to look for, and what how to drive well. We don't know, we don't we spend a tenth the time on the body, and it's all like if this warning sign goes, if you basically don't drive. But if you see this warning sign, run to your doctor. End of story. And yeah, um, yeah, it's it's. I love that you're. You guys rock. You're amazing. Thank, Thank you. you. There is one thing I did want to want to add um, in your question about whether or not we face pushback. Yeah. And I want to raise um, when Veronica and I were doing the youth sexual health plan, the next, the current plan under which we're working um, at uh, DC Health. We got a lot of pushback around the concept of teen pregnancy mm -hmm. prevention, and we refused to say specifically we want to prevent teens from getting pregnant because we didn't want to make it seem as though there aren't youth who, where youth don't have the power to make decisions over their fertility and mm -hmm. over their reproductive choices. And so we were very clear in that distinction because we felt that you know the constant emphasis on the social cost and the financial cost of teen pregnancy really overshadowed you know the fact that there are youth who are ready and prepared and want to have a baby and if that is their choice then we are supposed to support them the real the true social cost and financial cost come from the lack of support and the pressure that we put on youth to make decisions that we feel that they should be making and you know there was a lot of uh, sort of that was a difficult conversation like unplanned to have. pregnancy versus yes. a teen pregnancy exactly two different things and yes and 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 it and it's very people it's very uncomfortable with mm -hmm. people it sits very uncomfortably um, it really was the probably the only place we had pushback yeah um, and there are young there are young people that are doing this work mm -hmm. um, there's a group in New Mexico uh, I can't Momentum, think of the name of Momentum. and they are they're amazing at this yeah. they're young women who are who say you know don't don't talk about me just as as a as a prevention right. need right. or um, a social. That. You know that they that are, these are our bodies and we make decisions over them. And yeah. there's a lot of conversation around LARC, you yeah. know, long acting reversible contraceptive, which is amazing. You know, like I have one, it's great. Mm -hmm. um, I chose. I talked to my doctor. I talked to my partner, and I made decisions about it. And for for our teenagers, particularly teenagers of color, um, mm -hmm. the young Latina and young Black women, um, there is there is sometimes what feels like a push to have them you know, have a lark inserted. Mm -hmm. um, and there are young women who are like, I don't want that. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, it will prevent unplanned pregnancies, but it doesn't mean that for every young woman, it is what she wants and she should have. There are, right. there are, you know, there, there are things that we as women need to make those decisions on our own. Right. And, yeah. And and I, I, yeah, I have to be really sensitive to estrogen. I can't take any of the, any of those yeah. based, like for me, that would be really, I would be ill the whole time. So like right. everybody should have you aware and make their own choices. And I yeah. thank you very yeah. much for that nuance. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, I'm trying to think, what else? Oh, I would say the last thing, this is not around pushback, but I think it kind of brings everything full circle to how do we now start to infuse this into our work at the government level. And I would say that, you know, one of the things, I came from the community background, as did Veronica, and as most of our team, we all were out in the community. One of the things that I faced that was a challenge being in the community environment is, you know, when you see a client in the room, you deal with both their sexual health needs, like their STI testing and all of that, and their family planning needs all in the same room. It's all the same thing. And being on the other side of the table, it felt very frustrating and dif difficult to work in a work on those two issues in such a siloed way. Yeah. And in the plan, we were very intentional about stating that when we're talking about youth sexual health, we're talking about youth sexual and reproductive health because we should be thinking about the whole person. You can't really we, separate them. Yeah. Right. We really wanted to be intentional about being holistic um, in terms of our, you know, in terms of how we were going to um, develop programs and services that target youth. Um, and and hopefully in the in the future as we kind of pull in our other government partners and, and agencies, that it's not just their sexual and reproductive, because mm -hmm. we're also talking about their educational and their mental health. And mm -hmm. sometimes it's hard for, for agencies to see why they should be at the table with the sex people. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> we're, we're scary, you know, like, mm -hmm. we, you know, and, and obviously we're not really shy about it either. No, so you're a lot of fun. It's hard. Um, and people usually use a library, although our libraries are really great. They actually allow HIV and STD testing in the building. Yeah. So, oh, wow. That's um, wonderful. You know, how do you get, yeah, 
we, we have some amazing librarians. Yep. They're a really underrated group of people. Yep. But they support it very much. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I've done youth HIV and SCI testing in many a library. Oh, yeah. That's mm -hmm. fabulous. And we're like getting people who don't really realize why they should be at the table at the table with us. But that's kind of moving forward, you know, where we're going. Yeah. Wow. I think it's bring more kids into the library. I mean, <laughs> 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 get a book. I mean, you know, you can't go wrong. Yeah. So I love um, that you're doing this. I think about, you know, all the social determinants of health and, you know, be very um, thoughtful about, you know, the other issues that impact youth sexual health. Again, their decisions around, um, you know, their sexual health decisions um, and just their knowledge of self and their ability to access services. You know, we're trying to tell people when you have youth who are homeless or, how, or who have unstable housing that are coming through your doors, you need to also think about yes, food and income and jobs, but sex is another area, you know, where you need to think about a person's sexual health. And I get it, oftentimes it's difficult for a client who's in such a circumstance to prioritize their sexual health. So that's where- So bring it right to them. Yeah, so they so don't bring have it right to the table. I love that. Um, so we're running out of time, but I would love to hear, you know, thank you, you guys are amazing. Um, why did you choose Woodhull as your a venue to share this at? What do you like about Woodhull? I don't remember how it came across my, my desk, but I saw it. And I mean, Sexual Freedom Summit, that right there, just kind of the name alone. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so we usually are at um, you know, public health venues. That's usually where we're, we present and where we share what we're doing. Um, and we, we want to make sure that we're able to share, one, learn, but also able to share with folks like what a Department of Public Health can do mm -hmm. um, if they use a little imagination and um, really work with their community mm -hmm. um, and think about how to push the boundaries. We know what we do isn't going to work and it really probably doesn't work in the same way in a really conservative town, mm -hmm. but what are the pieces that you can do and how do you partner with, you know, we do a lot of partnering with radio stations and people who do sexual health work um, in the community in, in different ways and mm -hmm. kind of pop-up shops mm -hmm. and you know how do you partner so maybe you don't have to take all the heat but the work is getting done mm -hmm. um, yeah. and so that was why um, you know for us it seemed like a great place to kind of reach some of those people who could could approach a Department of Public Health and say you know I could do some of this with your help but I could I could be the one doing it so how to be creative um, and I also thought the fact that um, uh, Woodhull was really um, focusing intentionally on communities of color this year, that definitely spoke to us. I mean, we're DC, uh, you know, it's Chocolate City. Um, a mm -hmm. lot of our work is with um, you know, uh, black and brown youth and, and, and adults as well. So that was really an important piece, like as the shift was coming and that was becoming a priority mm -hmm. um, to be there and, and to share what we're doing and also to learn from folks who are doing some of the work we want to do or incorporate into to what we do. I think the other piece that I would add to that is, um, I don't know if you're familiar, but if you ever do get a chance to see our prep commercial that we recently released, it was, it's very risque, tongue in cheek. Nice. <laughs> it's edgy, but it gets the message. We'll be part. showing it, yeah. actually. We'll so. be oh, showing great. It, I look forward to it. Um, that at the end of the commercial, you know, it, it has like DC Health logo and what have you. And any and every time I've shared it with one, someone, their reaction is always, wow, that's from the Department of Health? And I say, well, why can't we be seen that way? Why do we have to be seen as like, you know, these square Gray rigid, suits and, yeah, and just and HIV <laughs> and STIs, nobody's having sex. I mean, it, it just, it, it struck me as the perception that pub, the public has around certain institutions and the kind of messaging or expectations that the institution has of the people that it serves. And I, hope that you know our approach allows the people that we serve to really see us as partners in their sexual you know health in terms of just just yeah we want you to have some good sex and safe sex because it'll keep you healthy yeah. and that's for us <laughs> you know what i'm saying so i just really want to as veronica said set the example like this is what government can do and this is what government who we can be um if we just try to be a little bit more creative I love it. Thank you both so much for the work you're doing out there. It's so exciting to know this is happening.